Ladies and gentlemen. This episode is sponsored by Advanced Skills Company, the official agent of JPI Healthcare in Iraq. I personally use the products of JPI Healthcare in my clinic for years now, and throughout the years, these products have been amazing in terms of providing excellent image quality at the lowest radiation dose possible, and they are durable, reliable, and efficient. I recommend if you are looking to establish your radiology practice, whether in a clinic, in a center, or in a hospital setting, to go to the JPI Healthcare website, see their products for yourself, and then call Advanced Skills Company if you are in Iraq, and these guys will provide the best possible solutions, whether in terms of hardware or software. I will leave the contact information in the video description, and don't forget to use the magic word highlights in radiology, because you will get a 10% discount on all JPI Healthcare products till the end of 2024. Hello everyone and welcome to the 12th and final episode of Season 2 of Highlights in Radiology. Since in the last episode we talked about a neurismal bone cyst, I thought that in this episode we have to talk about giant cell tumor, because they can look very similar to each other. Before we start, I want to remind you to subscribe, like, share, and tell your friends about us. This is Dr. Ahmed Ghaya Abdul Wahab, and this is Highlights in Radiology Season 2. Stay with me. Giant cell tumor is a locally aggressive neoplasm composed of osteoclast-like giant cells involving the epiphysis in skeletally mature patients. It represents 5% of all primary bone tumors and the sixth most common primary bone tumor. It can be associated with Gold syndrome, also known as focal dermal hypoplasia, which is a rare condition characterized by multiple anomalies of skin, teeth, and bone. Giant cell tumor is characterized by its high recurrence rate, and it has a metastatic potential, usually to the lungs. These metastatic lesions are benign pulmonary implants seen in 1-2% to of cases, and usually occur in patients with stage 3 disease, and usually within 3 years after the removal of the primary giant cell tumor. It can be seen without prior surgery. The metastatic lesions have a self-limiting growth potential and are histologically benign. They may regress spontaneously. Giant cell tumor involving the distal radius are often more aggressive than other locations. Primary malignant giant cell tumors are extremely rare. The most common presentation is pain and swelling at the affected area, relieved by decreased activity. It can mimic internal derangement of the knee. Pathologic fractures are seen in 30% of cases, also there is limited range of motion of the joint adjacent to the affected area. Most of the patients are 20 to 55 years of age, so the giant cell tumor tends to occur after skeletal maturity, and it is rare in children, seen in only about 1% of cases. It is seen twice more in females than in males, and it's more common in Chinese population. The clinical behavior of giant cell tumor cannot be predicted on the basis of radiologic and histologic features. It has a locally aggressive behavior with a 12 to 50% recurrence rate and can undergo sarcomatous transformation spontaneously or in response to radiation therapy. Three surgical stages are seen in giant cell tumor. In stage 1, the lesion is latent, while in stage 2, the lesion is active, and on stage 3, the lesion is aggressive in behavior. Treatment includes curettage with cryotherapy, phenol, or liquid nitrogen, to reduce recurrence rate. In stage 1 and 2 lesions, surgical resection with filling of the resection cavity with bony graft or methyl acrylate is done, while in stage 3 lesions, curettage alone is associated with high recurrence rate. Wide excision is done in case of recurrence. Radiation is done only for cases of unresectable tumors because of the risk of sarcomatous transformation. Arterial embolization of giant cell tumor involving the sacrum can be done, and resection of the pulmonary implants also can be done. So what radiology can offer in cases of giant cell tumors? 
First, we should know the common locations of giant cell tumors. It originates in the metaphysial side of the growth plate, so it is centered at the metaepiphysis, with subsequent growth to the subchondral bone. It is seen in the long bones in about 75-90% to 90 of cases. It is seen around the knee in 50-65% to 65 of cases. As in this example of giant cell tumor involving the lateral femoral condyle and extending to the articular surface of the condyle in this patient with closed growth plate. It's also seen in the radius in 10% of cases. Like in this example of giant cell tumor involving the distal radius with involvement of the articular surface in this patient with a closed growth plate. This location is associated with more aggressive behavior than other locations. Giant cell tumors seen in the humerus in 6% of cases. As in this example of giant cell tumor involving the humeral head in this patient with closed growth plate. Also, they might be seen in the spine in 7% of cases. Like in this example of giant cell tumor involving the C5 vertebral body with pathological loss of height seen. Also, giant cell tumors can be seen in the hands and feet in 5% of cases. As in this example of giant cell tumor involving the proximal phalanx of the middle finger with the involvement of the proximal articular surface in this patient with a closed growth plate. Giant cell tumors also seen in pelvis in 4% of cases. Like in this example of giant cell tumor involving the left iliac bone in this patient with closed growth plates. Giant cell tumors can be multifocal in 0.5 to 1% of cases in association with Paget's disease. The size of giant cell tumor can range from 2 to 20 cm. Regarding a plain x-rays, giant cell tumor is seen as an eccentric lytic bone lesion with well-defined borders, causing expensive remodeling with apparent cortical permeation in 20 to 50% of cases. Also, it shows conspicuous peripheral trabeculae without tumor matrix or what's called soap bubble appearance. It might show septations with no marginal sclerosis, while periosteal reaction is seen in only 10 to 30% of cases. Like in this case of giant cell tumor of the distal radius in this patient with a closed growth plate or skeletal mature patient, the lesion is seen as an eccentric lytic bone lesion with well-defined borders, causing expensile remodeling with apparent cortical permeation. Also, it shows conspicuous peripheral trabeculae without tumor matrix or what's called soap bubble appearance. No marginal sclerosis is seen and no periosteal reaction. Another example of giant cell tumor of the medial tibial condyle in this patient with closed growth plate. Again, the lesion is seen as an eccentric lytic bone lesion involving the articular surface with well-defined borders causing expensile remodeling with apparent cortical permeation without tumor matrix, no marginal sclerosis, and no periosteal reaction. Another example of giant cell tumor of the lateral femoral condyle in this patient with a closed growth plate. Again, the lesion is seen as an eccentric lytic bone lesion with well-defined borders involving the articular surface and is causing expensile remodeling with apparent cortical permeation. Also, it shows faint conspicuous peripheral trabeculae without tumor matrix, what's called soap bubble appearance. No marginal sclerosis seen and no periosteal reaction. On CT scan, giant cell tumors show soft tissue attenuation with foci of low attenuation representing areas of hemorrhage or necrosis. It may break through the cortex with cortical thinning and can cause soft tissue invasion. As we see in this CT scan of the knee, the giant cell tumor shows soft tissue attenuation with a break through the cortex with cortical thinning and soft tissue invasion. Another example in this CT scan of the pelvis, the giant cell tumor shows soft tissue attenuation with areas of low attenuation corresponding to hemorrhage or necrosis with a break through the cortex and cortical thinning, also soft tissue invasion, can be seen. On MRI and T1-weighted imaging, giant cell tumor will show low to intermediate signal intensity. T1-weighted images are the best to see the intramedullary portion of the tumor.
while in T2-weighted imaging, the tumor will show low to intermediate signal intensity with fluid fluid levels, like any small bone cyst. T2-weighted images are used to evaluate the extraosseous component of the tumor, as in this T1-weighted image of giant cell tumor showing intermediate signal intensity lesion with extension to the articular surface, as we can see, T1-weighted image is best to see the intramedullary portion of the tumor as in this example. While in this T2-weighted image of another patient, the tumor is showing intermediate signal intensity with fluid fluid levels, the tumor appears expensive. In this T1, T2, and post-contrast images, we can see that the T1-weighted MRI image is showing an eccentric lesion with mild expansion with intermediate signal intensity, while on T2-weighted MRI image, we can see low signal intensity due to hemosiderin deposition and high signal intensity through the secondary cystic changes. On post-contrast images, we can see marked relatively homogeneous post-contrast enhancement. On angiography, we can see neovascularity in 80% of cases as an intense heterogeneous capillary blush. As in this example of giant cell tumor of the femoral condyle, we can see intense heterogeneous capillary blush. Another example of giant cell tumor of the tibial condyle, we can see intense heterogeneous capillary blush, as we mentioned before. On bone scan, giant cell tumor will show donut sign, which is an intense uptake around the periphery of the lesion with little activity in the central portion. Bone scan may help in detection of multicentric giant cell tumor. Like in this bone scan of giant cell tumor of the tibia, showing donut sign with intense uptake around the periphery with little activity in the central portion. So what's the differential diagnosis of giant cell tumors? The list here includes aneurysmal bone cyst, intraosseous ganglion, chondroblastoma, osteosarcoma, and giant cell reparative granuloma. Regarding aneurysmal bone cyst, it rarely affects the articular surface of the bone and it's seen in younger age group before the closure of the growth plate. It may coexist with giant cell tumor. Like in this example of a neurosmal bone cyst of the radius, the growth plate is not closed and the patient is young. The lesion is not involving the articular cells. Another example of this neurosmal bone cyst of the distal tibia, again, the growth plate is not closed, the epiphysis is not involved, the patient is young, and the articular surface is spared. Intraosseous ganglion usually has a sclerotic border and is eccentric in location. Like in this example of intraosseous ganglion of the ulna, we can see a sclerotic border. Another example of intraosseous ganglion of the lateral tibial condyle showing a sclerotic border and is eccentric in location. Chondroblastoma appears as a radiolucent bone lesion with internal fluffy calcifications in about half of the cases. A narrow zone of transition is seen with bone mineralization and trabeculation. Also, industrial scalloping and cortical thinning may be seen, and it is seen in younger age group than giant cell tumors. As in this X-ray of chondroblastoma of the greater trochanter showing a radiolucent bone lesion with internal fluffy calcifications with narrow zone of transition. Internal trabeculations also seen and industrial scalloping and cortical thinning. Another example of chondroblastoma of the tibial epiphysis appearing as a radiolucent lesion with a narrow zone of transition and industrial scalloping and cortical thinning seen in this young patient with open growth plates. Another example of chondroblastoma of the medial femoral condyle that appears as a radiolucent bone lesion with internal fluffy calcifications and a narrow zone of transition with trabeculations, cortical thinning, and endosteal scalloping. Osteosarcoma demonstrates aggressive pattern of periosteal reaction and osseous matrix. As in this example of osteosarcoma showing aggressive pattern of periosteal reaction with sunburst appearance and prominent osseous matrix, and apparent soft tissue involvement. Another example of osteosarcoma is seen here, showing aggressive pattern of periosteal reaction, including sunburst appearance and Codman's triangle with prominent osseous matrix. Finally, giant cell reparative granuloma, which is a benign 
reparative lesion in the small bones of the hands and feet, and it appears as a solitary radiocent expensile lesion with narrow zone of transition. Like in this example of giant cell reparative granuloma seen in the distal phalanx of the finger, it appears as a solitary radiolucent lesion with narrow zone of a transition. Another example of giant cell reparative granuloma seen in the distal phalanx of the finger, and again it appears as a solitary radiolucent expensile lesion with narrow zone of transition. Well, this was all for today's episode and for this season of Highlights in Radiology. I just want to tell you guys that I have no team helping me and everything in this season was done just by me. From research, to script writing, to recording, to sound processing, to video editing, to publishing. So if there is any mistake or inadequate presentation, please forgive me. I'm a radiologist, not a director, and I'm trying to do my best here. Any ideas on how to improve the talks and what to discuss in season three of Highlights in Radiology, I would be happy to hear your suggestions. At the end, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and tell your friends about us. If you have any comments, write them in the comment section. See you next season. This was Dr. Ahmed Ghia Abdelwahab, and this was Highlights in Radiology season two. Bye.